This is Bold Dominion, a state politics explainer for Changing Virginia. I'm Nathan Moore. There aren't very many Supreme Court cases that are household names. Brown v. Board of Education, Loving v. Virginia, Roe v. Wade. But that last one has now been overturned by a new household name, Dobbs v. Jackson. Of course, unlike those other cases that expanded Americans' rights and liberties, Dobbs restricts them. The Supreme Court ruled that the Constitution does not confer a right to abortion and that states can require forced birth if they so choose. You've probably seen lots of maps circulating on social media about what this means on a state-by-state basis. We know that abortion is legal and likely to remain codified in law in places like New England and the West Coast. We know that women in the Deep South will need to travel a long distance to receive adequate reproductive health care. And we also know that forced birth advocates in places like Texas are trying to criminalize that kind of travel. But what about Virginia? Virginia is a state that oscillates back and forth between uh, like Republican control and Democrat control. We have a fairly even balance in this state. And what that means is this question of whether abortion is going to remain legal or not is an open one that's going to remain open every time there's a new election. This is Jesse Higgins. She's the managing editor at Charlottesville Tomorrow. Both chambers are up for re-election next year. So it is entirely possible that we could have a future in Virginia where abortion is banned and then reinstated and then banned and then reinstated. And I'm not really sure what that looks like for the organizations. They're, they're going to have to plan for a very uncertain future where they are going to spend years being the closest legal provider and then possibly spend years having to help people in our state travel out. Indeed, Republicans in the Virginia General Assembly are already writing such bills. And Governor Glenn Youngkin recently said, Any bill that comes to my desk, I will sign happily and gleefully in order to protect life. The governor has also floated banning abortions after 15 weeks as a potential compromise position. So far, Democratic leaders in the state Senate have not shown an interest in taking that compromise. And according to several national and state polls, the Democrats are more in line with public opinion on this issue. The majority of Americans support access to abortion. This is actually a really wild disconnect between popular opinion and legislative interference. Most Americans do not want to see Roe versus Wade overturned, and yet our legislators think that they do. That's Tannis Fuller. She's the executive director of the Blue Ridge Abortion Fund. Today on Bold Dominion, we're airing a reprise of our interviews in May with Tannis Fuller and Charlottesville Tomorrow reporter Charlotte Woods. Now that Roe has officially been struck down, we look at how this is likely to unfold in Virginia. We start with Charlottesville Tomorrow reporter Charlotte Woods. Bold Dominion assistant producers Sadie Randall and Omega Ilovich sat down with her this spring. Can you give us a brief overview of this draft opinion and explain what the consequences of this ruling may be? So I suspected abortion would come up a bit of a bigger topic this year. It's also an election year. So, you know, the topic always resurfaces every single time because of this court case through Mississippi that's made its way to the Supreme Court of the United States where they would restrict abortions at the 15 week mark. And so there's that possibility that, you know, Roe v. Wade would be reexamined as this court case made its way to SCOTUS. And then the the leaked draft opinion indicated that it seems likely that it will be overturned. Justices Samuel Alito, Clarence Thomas, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett seem to favor overturning Roe versus Wade. It would be Stephen Breyer, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan would dissent. And then Justice Kintaji Brown-Jackson is actually not on the board yet or on the court yet, so she can't weigh in. And then Justice John Roberts, it's unclear how he will vote, but right now, again, it seems likely that it will be overturned given how many people support overturning it. And then that would put things, the question of restriction or access to abortions in the hands of every single state in the country. I was speaking with Rich Schrager, who's a professor at UVA. He was saying he kind of envisions like a patchwork of a patchwork quilt of different laws around the, around the country. At Charlottesville Tomorrow, you recently wrote an article with Tamika John Charles about people from out of state seeking reproductive care in Virginia. So what makes Virginia more of a safe haven? 
for abortion than other states? Yeah. So Delegate Sally Hudson, she actually said that right now Virginia is you know, technically a safe haven and it could remain that way if the state's General Assembly and the governor allow it to stay that way. Um, I do expect some push and pull between state legislators and the governor um, and different activists and lobbyists. Let me go back to it. Yes. And so like right now, actually, my colleague Tamika was speaking with the Blue Ridge Health Abortion Fund, and they were saying that, you know, if we rewind back to last last fall when Texas had its own um, abortion restrictions at I think it was six weeks, which it, for some people don't even know that they're pregnant at that point, because that would put you maybe around two weeks past your miss, missed period. And sometimes your periods can run on a strange schedule. And so they said that they were receiving calls already from people in Texas seeking um, assistance with getting an abortion. And so going back to what Sally Hudson was saying, there's already about 22 states, at least 22 states that have language on the books ready to go that would immediately take effect once Roe, v, Roe versus Wade is overturned, which would either completely outlaw or massively restrict abortion access, which would create, you know, I could see a lot of people coming to Virginia or calling and asking for services here. And um, of the about 16 abortion providers in the state of Virginia, two of those are actually here in Charlottesville. As of right now, there are several, Texas is one of the states that has a trigger law basically on place. It would ban everything the moment that Roe v. Wade um, is overturned. But then there's other states like Colorado um, or California, New York that have laws that protect abortion access. Um, and then there's a lot of states that have, you know, unenforced pre row ban uh, um, on abortions. Like before Roe took effect, there were already some states that were had previously been um, not allowing it. As you said, Virginia has become one of these states that is allowing a lot more abortion protection for individuals from out of state than their own states are providing. So what effects will this out of state migration for healthcare have on the state of Virginia and how are local abortion providers that you've spoken to been preparing for these changes? A lot of it does come down to funding. A lot of these abortion providers, if it's not through your actual hospital and you're going to some place like Planned Parenthood, Women's Whole Health, which is another um, like national affiliate of um, abortion clinics that has a location in Charlottesville, a lot of it comes down to funding because a lot of these places are like nonprofits. They seek a lot of donations and grants. And just making sure that if you are seeing an influx of out-of-state patients plus your in-state patients, you want to make sure that you have the funding available to continue to operate the medical supplies that are needed. You know, you have to have resources to do these things. I could see a lot of people wanting to step up their donating, you know. Meanwhile, at there, there are, um, you know, different advocacy groups. Like right now, I actually ended up speaking with, very briefly, with the Family Foundation, which is anti-abortion. They are planning to, you know, once, you know, if Roe v. Wade is overturned, they are planning on, you know, advocating to legislators that are like-minded with them on walking, walking back some restrictions, like, for an instance, an example would be like mandating like a 24 hour waiting period between when you seek an abortion and when you're able to actually get it. Whereas, you know, on the flip side, there are lots of advocates and lobbyists and legislators that will be pushing to protect abortion access. Senator Cree Deeds uh, spoke with me about how maybe perhaps Virginia legislators could enshrine it into the state's code or the state's constitution, which would be a bit more binding state level protection since there would no longer be any federal level protection. Where do you believe the Virginia General Assembly currently stands in terms of abortion opinion? And how does this safe haven that Virginia currently have has the potential to change? Um, This is why uh, Delegate Sally Hudson said elections matter. Um, And I foresee for years to come, once Roe versus Wade gets overturned, I see Every election, this is going to be something that matters to people, whether they want to protect abortion access or restrict abortion access. It's going to be a huge campaign talking point. It's going to be a huge driving factor to vote for or against someone. Um, And honestly, right now, it's not totally partisan, but largely, largely partisan. It seems to be something that Democrats support while Republicans usually don't. There's obviously nuances in the spectrum in there. And we saw last fall, the Republicans gained control of the House of Delegates. Right now, the Democrats have a majority in Senate by one seat. And we obviously have a Republican governor who has been very out and about on being very um, anti-abortion. So it's really going to come down to what seats flip or what seats remain the same in the next year ahead, at least. There's elections later this year. And then, you know, 2023 is when the House of Delegates actually has their next round of elections. Um, So we could start to see protections or restrictions surfacing in the, I think, the 2024 legislative session for sure. You mentioned 
at the end of your article how Chief Justice Roberts is also a swing vote and here in Virginia, Senator Joe Morrissey is also considered a swing vote. How do you think these two swings can compare for Virginia? Yeah, so Roberts will be, he's the one to watch when SCOTUS looks at possibly overturning Roe versus Wade. Although if he does side with the um, justices that are planning to dissent overturning it, it still is not enough of a majority, which is why it's very likely that Roe versus Wade may be overturned. I know that Congress has been working on things like the Women's Health Protection Act, which it um, passed the House, but it failed to pass the Senate recently. So legislators who want to protect still find other routes to protect access. They're going to have to go back to the drawing board and come up with some additional legislation, build some consensus, hopefully get things passed. If those if things get through Congress, um, I think we know where Joe Biden will stand on signing that. And then in the state level, same thing, you know, things have to go through the House and Senate before they can go to the governor. Even if Morrissey does, you know, swings in the direction of favoring abortion protection, it's also still likely that Governor Youngkin may veto it. I remember when Terry McAuliffe was governor, I was reporting, I watched him sign a lot of different vetoes because when you have split control of your um, House and your Senate, or even if the opposite party of you is controlling both of those chambers. Your job as governor is to, you know, you sign things into law or you veto things and you are the last line of defense on something. And for Youngkin, he would be defending against pro-abortion legislation. Obviously, we have congressional midterms this year, but at the state level, the House of Delegates, technically their election is 2023. There was a lawsuit that would have required them to run again this year because of the redistricting maps were delayed. So I'm not sure what the latest update is with that case. It's been dragging on for a while and it could change everything. (laughs) So we could be having House of Delegates up for election this year. Seemingly unlikely given the fact that that case is still dragging and the primaries are already happening and conventions are already happening, um, at least for congressional races. By 2023, that will be an election year, the official election year for House of Delegates with and for Senate. And it's all of those seats. Um, And that's when, like I said, things could, could flip anyway or stay the same. Do you think that abortion access could be a hot issue in the upcoming elections this fall? I absolutely think it will be, and it will continue to be a hot topic for elections every year across the country um, for a very long time. I could see, you know, a lot of different states increasing restrictions or walking back restrictions. This is why things go to SCOTUS, or this is why things get enshrined in state constitution or the U.S. constitution, because it's harder to walk it back. Roe versus Wade has been in effect for 49 years. It's a 49-year-old ruling that it's taken for the people who wanted it overturned this whole time. It's pretty much taken 49 years to, to get it to this point. It could take a long time to get it back. So at the state level, we're going to, like I said, we're going to see a lot of states leaning in or leaning against this. Um, Virginia has been very purple-ish indigo. <laughs> you know, we've got a lot of Republicans and Democrats and some every flavor in between here in the state. And so I think abortions will it will be a huge campaign topic every single year. I think legislatively, we're going to see a lot of push and pull, and it will be subject to who holds the majority every every two, every four, every six years. And it largely, it's not totally partisan, but it is largely partisan. So it is something that like when we see more Democrats in power, we are more likely to see abortion being protected in Virginia. When we see more Republicans in power, we are more likely to see abortion access not being protected in Virginia. On May 14th, hundreds of protesters marched from Charlottesville's federal courthouse to the free speech wall on the downtown mall as a part of the Bans Off Our Bodies demonstration. So how do you see concerned citizens in Charlottesville calling on the Virginia Senate to protect reproductive rights? And what makes local activism like this important? Charlottesville is very full of very active, engaged residents. And it's really inspiring to see how many people here speak up about the things that they care about. And they they work hard to advocate for themselves, for their communities, for their friends, for people who aren't even in Virginia. I could see, I think a lot of organizing around here. And we we also see a lot of young people. We see this past week, I mean, the Charlottesville Youth Action Committee has been very working very hard on bringing awareness to a multitude of issues. And every day, more and more people turn 18 and are able to vote and start educating themselves on the things that they need to know and what they care about. And I think going forward, one, voting is a huge way to have impact. Who are you helping get in or out of different offices? Making sure that you call and email your legislators at the local, state, and federal level because they they compile that information. They use that information. It helps them know how they can best represent the people that, that elected them. 
like graduated this past weekend and like a couple of law students that I saw had keep abortion legal pins on their gowns. So I was wondering how you see that more towards TVA students and their organizations focusing on reproductive rights getting a chance to go and have a say towards these politicians in the Senate. So whenever an active General Assembly session is underway, which is usually, you know, a couple of months at the beginning of every year, organizing groups go to Richmond, go in, speak during public comments, catch your legislators in between chambers when they're walking back to their office, flag them down, say hi, I would I would love to talk to you about XYZ. And then also there's a lot of nonprofit organizations and advocacy groups around the state that if people are interested, you can volunteer with, you could even start working for the power of lobbying. Everyone can do it. <laughs> it's in, but it does come down to accessibility because participating in democracy, it takes time. It takes your, it takes your, it takes your time. It takes your resources. Um, so just figuring out for yourself um, how much you want to get involved and exactly how you want to get involved. There's more passive and more active ways to have your voice heard. Charlotte Woods is a government reporter at Charlottesville Tomorrow. Stay with us through a short break. In the second half of today's show, we're talking with someone who promotes abortion accessibility here in Virginia. You're listening to Bold Dominion, a state politics explainer for a changing Virginia. Visit us online at bolddominion.org. If you've ever had a question about state politics, let us know. Maybe we'll do a show about it. Shoot us an email at bolddominion.org at virginia.edu. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are served up. Go ahead and subscribe, and leave a nice review while you're there. We love those. Bold Dominion is a member of Virginia Audio Collective, online at virginiaaudio.org. Check out all the podcasts from the collective, from science to history to music to community affairs. We amplify the voices of people in our community and help them tell stories that matter. You can listen and subscribe at virginiaaudio.org. This month has been tumultuous for the state of reproductive rights in America. Virginia has more legal support for abortion than many other states, but there's a fight brewing over reproductive health care. Blue Ridge Abortion Fund Executive Director Tannis Fuller is on the front lines of that fight. She spoke with Omega Ilovich and Sadie Randall about what abortion advocacy currently looks like in Virginia. Can you start by telling us a bit about your organization and how has the leaked Supreme Court opinion affected your organization and others in the area? The Blue Ridge Abortion Fund is an abortion fund in Virginia and we have been providing financial and practical support to Virginians and folks traveling to Virginia to access abortion care since 1989. The leaked Supreme Court draft has definitely created a lot of stress and anxiety in community and in the movement. But the reality is that Blue Ridge Abortion Fund and abortion funds like us have been navigating legislative and practical barriers to abortion care for decades. We are prepared for this moment. We know how to get people to their abortions. And so the draft doesn't have an immediate negative impact on the work that we do. So based on that, from your perspective, where does Virginia currently stand socially and politically in terms of abortion support? And how have lawmakers been reacting to the Supreme Court's opinion? Virginia occupies a really great And I'm going to say unusual because 10 years ago, I would never have thought we would be here as a state that has relatively protected access to abortion care for the time being. And we do expect that over the course of the next year, at least, assuming also that the Supreme Court does decide the way that the draft suggests that they will, that Virginia will receive patients from states where abortion has become highly restricted and or impossible to access. Virginia lawmakers, particularly Virginia senators, are influential in keeping that access and abortion through the next year, through the next General Assembly. They control the committees in the Senate and therefore can prevent anti-abortion legislation from reaching a four vote. They are confident that they will be able to hold that line for the next year. Whether or not that protection continues in Virginia will depend very much on the next election. Does public opinion currently support abortion access pretty strongly? In the state of Virginia, yes. Actually, everywhere in the country. Yes, the majority of Americans support access to abortion. This is actually a really wild disconnect between popular opinion and legislative interference. Most Americans do not want to see Roe versus Wade overturned, and yet our legislators think that they do. What general consequences do you think this decision will have for the state of Virginia? 
I think the consequences of this decision will impact Virginia in increased um, competition for available appointments. This changes, right, because sometimes clinics don't have a provider or they don't have staff, and so they're not able to see patients at that moment. But we have generally accessible abortion care in Virginia, but competition for appointments is going to become more of a reality. And so folks who are seeking care from out of state, right, we saw this in Texas. This is like we know exactly what's going to happen because we saw what happened in states surrounding Texas after SBA was passed. And so we'll start to see a ripple effect of limited access for an enormous number of people. Do you think that we can encourage more support for reproductive care on the state level? Or do you possibly foresee Virginia legislators turning in the other direction and tightening restrictions given our political standing right now? It is definitely a fear that if the midterm elections do not preserve protection of abortion access, right? If we elect a bunch of anti-abortion legislators in some way, I don't think that the protection of abortion will remain in Virginia. Is that going to be a full assault on abortion access where we might have the General Assembly outlaw abortion? Or will we see a return to mandatory ultrasounds, waiting periods, other sorts of softer barriers to abortion care? I don't know. There's a part of me that wants to say, yes, it will be softer barriers to abortion care. They will be more inconvenient and they will be frustrating, but it will not make abortion impossible to have in Virginia. But Miare's, our attorney general, has definitely stated that he would like the Supreme Court to overturn Roe versus Wade. So I don't know that we can count on that moderate response. In response to this kind of uncertain political standing, how have you and other abortion activists and organizations prepared yourselves for these changes? Blue Ridge Abortion Fund in particular is one of five organizations, five other abortion funds in the Mid-Atlantic who have been part of a grant award starting a year or so ago that recognized that the Mid-Atlantic would be influential in any negative Supreme Court decision. So we received grants to staff up our organizations, which has been really uh, helpful, right? Because an organization that has staff can better respond to the needs of the people that we are serving. What have we done to prepare? Well, we have staff now. And also we have been working to tighten our connections to abortion funds that are in other states, particularly states where abortion may be harder or impossible to access, as well as to establish relationships with clinics in states that we have not historically had relationships with, like Pennsylvania and New Jersey, because we do anticipate a lot more of that travel. We see travel now for abortion care. This is not new. People have been traveling for abortion care for a long time for a variety of reasons. But that travel will become more complicated and will require more distance, I think, as I was talking about people competing for appointments. We'll start to see people from Virginians who might have to travel to New Jersey or they might have to travel to Pennsylvania for care. And so we have been working really diligently over the last six months to establish relationships with those clinics and other funds so that when we need to work together to ensure patient care, we already have a baseline established for how we all can work together because it is the strength of community and relationships that pull us through crises. And that's what we're looking at. Your organization is largely committed to providing accessible avenues for reproductive health care through fundraising. First, why is financial accessibility such an important part of protecting reproductive rights? Financial accessibility is critical to making abortion accessible because rich people will always be able to access abortion care. In Virginia, in particular, patients who have Medicaid are not able to use their Medicaid for their abortion care. And so folks who would otherwise potentially have insurance to cover other sorts of health care cannot access that care through their insurance. And so providing financial support is an economic equalizer. It says that just because you are someone who may not have a lot of extra money in your bank account or the ability to otherwise afford a $400 to $2,000 semi-emergency expense doesn't mean that you are someone who is not deserving of the ability to access an abortion. Where do you tend to focus your fundraising efforts when trying to gain support for your organization's work, especially in such a tumultuous time like this? We have a great base of grassroots supporters. Mm -hmm. Um, The majority of our support has come from small community donations in Charlottesville, Albemarle, um, throughout the state of Virginia. As the profile of abortion access has become greater, we've definitely started to see individual donations from around the country. Um, But the majority of our support comes from people who feel strongly about other people's ability to access abortion care. Our fundraising relies a lot on that engagement of, I know somebody who knows somebody who cares about this and let me talk to them about this work. And then some grants and foundations as well. 
thinking about inclusionary terms, there are non-binary and genderqueer individuals who have uteruses who are now being considered in this fight. How has the Blue Ridge Abortion Fund helped these individuals who need access to reproductive care? The Blue Ridge Abortion Fund has acknowledged and amplified that it is not just women who receive abortion care for the past seven years. We very much understand that everyone needs to be able to access abortion. And I think that the abortion funding movement in in particular has been really clear about correcting folks who talk often about this being a women's issue. This is not a women's issue. This is the issue of anyone who has the capacity to become pregnant. And beyond that, this is a community issue because having access to safe abortion care positively impacts all of our communities because when people are able to make decisions that are best for themselves, regardless of their gender or their identity presentation, they are better able to be full members of a community in a way that is best for the community. How do you assume this will affect people coming in? And you've spoken about like the wait list of people and that ripple effect of like having to deal with that as well. So I think that this work, I have always been an advocate for abortion access. And I think that some of that, I've been pregnant. I have children. I know that in abortion funding, we talk a lot about everybody knows someone who's had an abortion. Somewhere between one in three and one in four people with the capacity to become pregnant will have an abortion in their reproductive lifetimes, which means that abortion is incredibly common. You very likely have benefited from someone in your family or your friend circle who has had access to safe abortion care. And this is what I mean when I talked a minute ago about, you know, abortion access is an, is an issue for our communities. And I think that when we talk with our callers, what we hear very frequently is that they are committed to caring for the children that they have. A number of, I think over 50% of people who have abortions are caregivers of small children. They are very committed to ensuring that the kids that they have can be cared for in a way that is most reflective of the way that they want their families to look and that there's a lot of frustration that abortion is challenging to to access. Even in Virginia, in a state that has very few legislative barriers to abortion care, there's only a few geographic places that you can get abortions. There are clinics in Roanoke, Charlottesville, Richmond, Tidewater, and Northern Virginia. And so if you are someone who lives in a more rural part of the state, accessing a clinic can be more complicated. Virginia does have telemedicine abortion available right now. And so if you are someone who has access to the internet and identification so that you can prove you are over 18, you can access a medication abortion through telemedicine. In this time of intense uncertainty, many people are beginning to feel very downtrodden and hopeless about the future of reproductive care. Um, What do you say to people who are feeling distressed about the possible fallout of this Supreme Court decision? And what do you think they should do? I think that is a very real and appropriate response to what is potentially going to become our lived experiences right now. I would also uplift that communities of color, our Black and our Brown, Indigenous and queer communities have always struggled to access abortion. And so we need to really recognize that a lot of the activation that some of us are feeling is from a position of not having our rights previously curtailed either directly or indirectly by the position that we occupy in our society. One of the best things that people can do is to find their local abortion fund. Blue Ridge Abortion Fund is a local abortion fund probably for your (laughs) listeners. Um, And start a monthly donation. One of the paths forward for this was is going to be money. Be patient. There are a lot of people who want to get involved right now, and we are navigating both that response as well as the work that we do to support callers every day. Yeah, one of the things that um, we are asking people is to really be clear with your friends and your community members that you are not just pro-choice, but you are pro-abortion. This is one of those moments where I encourage everybody to really think about why we have chosen choice over abortion in a way that we talk about this work and we talk about healthcare, Blue Ridge Abortion Fund, um, we have a bonfire store that you can find on our Instagram, buy a shirt. We have a couple shirts that say funding abortion is radical care. Everybody, every reason for an abortion is a good reason. Um, Think about wearing those shirts in public and think about having uncomfortable, hard conversations because when this Supreme Court decision comes down, we have to start thinking about how we're going to make abortion available in Mississippi again, because it's not enough that you can get an abortion in California and New York and Illinois. That will never be enough. And the way that we're going to make abortion available in Mississippi again is to change the culture around abortion. 
And the way that we change the culture about abortion is stop being quietly supportive, which also contributes to abortion st- shame and stigma. And to be just really clear, abortion is normal. Abortion is healthcare. You know, as I mentioned earlier, it's really common. We've all benefited from it. You know, everybody loves someone who's had an abortion. And at this moment, everybody loves someone who's going to need an abortion. Tannis Fuller is the executive director of the Blue Ridge Abortion Fund, based in Charlottesville. Many thanks to her and to Charlottesville Tomorrow's government reporter, Charlotte Woods. My name's Nathan Moore, and I'm the host of Bold Dominion. Our show this week was produced and edited by assistant producers Sadie Randall and Omega Ilovich. You can find us online at bolddominion.org. And don't forget to subscribe. It's just a click away. The VPM Daily Newscast is exactly that. The VPM News Team is working hard so every weekday morning a new episode is ready to start your day with all of the state and local news stories you need to stay connected to what matters in your community, all in 5 to 10 minutes. Jumpstart your day with the VPM Daily Newscast on NPR One or wherever you get your podcasts.